Yeah. We're gonna move on to I guess what whatever day this uh, I guess day four, day five, day six, whatever it is of kind of talking about some of the social issues, some of the the racial issues that are going on in society now. Um, Sergeant Paul Humphreys from LMPD. He's on he's on SWAT. He's been on the patrol. He's been on the, in, in it for a while. Good guy. I told him the last period class. I don't know any bad police officers to bring into here from a bad side of it, but he's going to clear up some misconceptions about what police officers are allowed to do. He's going to talk about some of the other stuff that we've addressed here in class. So I'd like you guys to be honest with him. I know there's a lot of lack of trust with police, and I'd like you to address it with them because the only way it gets cleared up is if we if we communicate. Okay. All right. So like you said, I've been on for about ten years. Uh, grew up in Louisville, just a little bit of background about where I work. I spent a couple years out in Newburgh, and I went down the west end of the Russell neighborhood. Uh, my beat was 15th to 32nd north of Broadway. And I went over to Beach of Terrace, spent about three years there, got promoted, went down to Smoketown, uh, all the way down to, uh, to, uh, to uh, Churchill Downs area. Uh, now I'm in internal affairs. I've been in internal affairs for just over a year, uh, about a year and a half. I've been on the SWAT team for about six years. So I've got a little bit of experience in a lot of different areas. And I'll sit up here and talk all day. I'll sit up here and talk the whole class period, but it'll go a lot a lot better and you'll get a lot more out of it if you just ask questions. I don't care what you ask. You can ask me just about anything, whether it's about me, whether it's about the police, whether you hate the police, whether you like the police. I'm good with it all. I've heard it all. I've been called every name in the book. You're not going to offend me. So, uh, I don't want to answer your question, I'll tell you I don't want to answer your question. Hey, like say, say you stop somebody from using a suspicion, like, like what, what's, what do you, what like, do you have to do, like, what's the process? Like, what do I have to do, or what should you do? No, what, what should you do, Bob, to know that you're doing? Okay, so. I'm ready, like, what's the bad for you, you know, like, <laughs> right. So, here's, here's the thing, is that he brought up reasonable suspicion. Reasonable suspicion and probable cause are the two standards that cops operate under. Okay? Reasonable suspicion is, is effectively, do I have enough evidence to say that a crime has probably occurred? Okay? So the example I used in the last, uh, in the last uh, class was, all right, I'm riding the beat in a neighborhood, and... I know in this area, in these couple of blocks, we've gotten four break-ins in the last three nights. And there's now a car that's, that's circling the block and has been around three or four times. Is that enough reasonable suspicion to stop that car? Yeah. Is that probable cause? No. No, it's not. It's, it's, it's enough reasonable suspicion that I, I'm legally allowed to kind of look into that and figure out what's going on. Are you right? allowed to search that car? I'll get to that. I'll get to that. So, under reasonable suspicion, I cannot search your car, okay? The only way that I can search, whether it's your car, your house, your person, you want to, you want to know the answer to the question? At this time, I need members of the math, I need consent, and national English honor probable society cause, society or search for your club picture. So if I stop math, you and, and, and I see some, some weed shake down in the floorboard, I smell weed from the car. I stopped you on reasonable suspicion. Now I have probable cause to search the car. Right? So, probable cause is that, is that, what's that? So now I have, now I have probable cause and I can search the car. Uh, if, if I stop you and you're like, hey, I'm on the phone with my friend, he's, he's, you know, and everything checks out, you know, he, I'm supposed to be picking him up, but I can't find him, and everything turns out, uh, you're on your way, right? Uh, and it's the same way if I have, I, I could have probable cause to stop you. You might not use a turn signal. Now instead of stopping on reasonable suspicion, I'm stopping on probable cause. You committed, you know, there was an actual crime, a viol law violation, no turn signal. Now I'm stopping you, and that doesn't, I still can't lock it up. Like a reasonable suspicion stop, I can't, I can't write you a ticket that says he was stopped for reasonable suspicion, but I can write you a ticket for a no turn signal. Yes. Yeah. Quota. Like, yeah. Okay, so, so like, a quota system is actually illegal. The Supreme Court rule 
years ago that the quota system was wrong. Not like what you had. <laughs> so a quota system has been it's been it's been the, it's been found to be illegal. And the reason why is because is because it ends up being predatory. So just because they need another staff. Yeah, 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 that's not that's been the What's that? Does Lula have a curfew? Yes. Eleven on weekdays and one on weekends. Yo, hey guys, get quiet now. For real. That's what we investigate. So if if you legitimately, if you have a complaint about the police, you don't know if they should have done what they did, what right? The time, to, the time to argue about that is not on the street. So so uh, let's say let's say you, you get out of control and you start yelling and stuff like that. Now, it's just going to make some, uh, an unfortunate situation worse, right? You got stopped, you didn't think you should. Now you're going to jail. Now you're fighting with the police, stuff like that. The time to fight about it is, well, talk to the officer afterwards. Let everything, let them do what they do. Talk to them afterwards and figure out what's going on, right? A lot of officers explain it to you, but I'll tell you, we get a lot of complaints because officers don't do a very good job of explaining what they were doing. So now, you call my office, you come down, we talk about it, we figure out what's going on, and I can do an investigation to figure out whether they were allowed to do that or not. Because I, I now I have a lot more information, a lot more access to stuff that I might not have had of you just telling me this story, right? So now I can figure out who the officers were, if they were called there, if they just went there on their own. I can look at their body camera footage. I can talk to the, uh, the people at T-Mobile and see, well, did, did T-Mobile say you were stealing something? Did, did somebody else call in and say this or that? So I can, I can get a lot more information that the officers have that will let me know whether or not what they did was right or wrong. And here's the thing is that we actually, a lot of people don't think we do, but we deal with officers who are doing wrong. Okay, they are disciplined. We just had an officer, I don't know if you saw it on the news, it was on the news earlier this week or late last week, the officer got 29 days suspension for an inappropriate Facebook post. So yes, you saw it? Yeah. What, what did he post? He, he reposted one of these memes that's going around. <laughs> Stupid. So, uh, but, Look, if you get 30 days, you're fired, right? He, he made one inappropriate post. He got 29 days. Officers doing stupid stuff and wrong stuff is not taking light. If this guy does anything over the next year, he gets fired, right? So this isn't, it's not like we take light. I know a lot of people think that we, we cover up the officers. A lot of people think that we cover up for officers and we look out for officers and stuff like that. That's not the case. Look, I do my job and I do it right. So I, I work very hard at my job and I don't want an officer out there making me look bad. That's not to say I do everything right every time because we all make mistakes. Uh, you know, we look at, we look at uh, Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson ain't making the right read on every play. Right? He practices way more than I do, I can tell you that. Uh, but he ain't making the right play every time. Tom Brady's not making the right play every time. Okay? 
So sometimes officers make mistakes, and it has nothing to do with, you know, in, uh, hatred of anybody or intent to do wrong. You, you're making decisions all day long, you've got to make mistakes. It happens. And that's part of what we do in our office. We have to separate the mistakes from somebody doing wrong. And so just to explain that process, if you came in and complained, I would do my investigation, I would write my letter, and I would say, I think the officer did right, or I think the officer did wrong. And it would go all through the chain of command, all the way up to the chief's office and the departmental lawyers and everything. And they would look at it, and they would, they would make a decision of, all right, the officer did right, the officer did wrong. Okay, the officer did wrong, now what level of discipline are they going to get? All the way from a letter in their file that says, you know, the officer should have had on a seatbelt during that accident. Or it could be 29 days of suspension with all kinds of other stipulations, transferred out of the division, going to get more training, all kinds of stuff. So it just it just depends on. Did he get paid suspension? No. No. This man he lost he lost a month of pay for his face work. And it's not about whether I agree or disagree with it. It was something stupid. So. Uh, but like I said, we we take we take officers doing wrong things seriously. All right, and just and I'll say this: just because you feel wrong doesn't mean an officer did something wrong. I swear. Do you, you see what I'm saying? I might not like getting pulled over. I might be mad at the officer for pulling me over. That doesn't mean the officer was wrong for pulling me over. Right? Have you ever been pulled over while you were a cop? So while I was a cop? Yeah. Yeah. Got a ticket since I was a cop. Uh, so, uh, I'll, I'll explain this to you, because I, I, I'll tell you, I didn't like the police when I was a kid, right? My dad was a cop, my sister was a cop, my mother was a dispatcher. When I was in high school, we used to hang out in the neighborhood and whatnot, I got run up on by the police way too much. Me and my friends get run up on by the police a couple times a week. I'm not doing that. I know I'm not doing that. I know my friends are dirty, but they're not doing anything either, right? They, they're kind of some, some crappy people, but they're my people. I'm hanging out with them. So one day, we stand out there at uh, Shelby and Burnett. My cousin walks up. My friend walks over to the can, shakes some dope out of the can, sells it to my cousin. I had no clue my cousin was a crackhead. I had no clue that all this time that, that we're standing out here on the corner, we're selling dope. <laughs> and now I'm like, well, I, I get why the police keep running up on us. So when I stopped hanging out with dope, dope selling friends, it's, it was like that. I stopped getting stopped by the police. I started minding my own business. Yeah, it sucked because these are the people I grew up with. I've known them since I was, you know, two years old. Mm -hmm. But I can't be, I can't be around you. It was, it was like magic. I didn't get stopped by the police anymore. I mean, I have, but not, you know, I, I'm not getting on the phone like I was. So, don't, for the majority of the time, if you're not doing dirt, if you're not people with people that are doing dirt, you really don't have much to worry about. You're going to get stopped by the police. Everybody gets stopped at some point. Some of us are going to get stopped more than others. But for the most part, you, you really don't have anything to worry about if you're not doing anything wrong. So you know how like sometimes like if you get pulled over, I mean it might not happen to guys, but like if like I've been pulled over twice and both times have been like that. Like is it illegal to let another cop go? Is it considered illegal? What do you mean let another Like if you were going like twenty over the speed limit and like one of your cop friends pulls you over, is it illegal to let you go? No, that's called discretion. We let people go all so the time. So it doesn't matter if you're a cop or not. No. Okay. We let people go all the time. Okay. You know, we give people warnings all the time. Uh, uh, Officer discretion, a whole lot of, like, there's times when we, like, traffic tickets, uh, some minor stuff. Uh, we don't have to cite people. We don't have to lock people up on a lot of stuff. It's up to us whether we do it or not. Um, like, sh take shoplifting, for instance. I have, I have the discretion on a shoplifter whether I'm going to lock them up or whether I'm going to write them a ticket. Well, I stop you. You know, they call. They say, you shoplifted. I look at your record. You've never done anything wrong. Here, show up to court. I look at your record. This is your 12th time getting stopped for shoplifting. You're going to jail, right? That's my discretion. I don't have to take you to jail. I don't have to write, write you a ticket on, you know. That's my discretion. So yeah, it, a lot of people think that we use discretion 
to get people in trouble or to lock people up. But the fact of the matter is, it's more work if I have to lock you up. And we, we know most people are going to do the least amount of work they can. So we use discretion to not lock people up because it's a lot of paperwork. So, you know, majority of the time, if, if you're cool, I've I let people go that have done dirt because they were cool about it. Like, dude, you seem like a good guy. You're doing the wrong thing today. Cut it out. Get on your way. Don't let me see you again. A lot of times it works. Sometimes it doesn't. You know, and each officer has their own, their own way of doing stuff. You know, I do stuff differently from any other officer. Just like, y'all are, we're, we're as different as, as anybody in this classroom. So we all got different opinions. We all got different ways we're going to do things. Um, and there's a big spectrum of what's right and what's wrong. Uh, as long as you're operating within those boundaries, At this time, uh, it's kind of allowed. Blood Drive Club and National Art Honor Society. Any other questions? Yes, for your pictures. Somebody that Blood has. Blood Drive and National yeah, Art Honor Society. No, Society uh, for your pictures. I was wondering, like, you said you did the like, SWAT team and stuff like that. What other, like, uh, what stuff have you done for the SWAT team before? Uh, well, for, for those of you who don't know, on, on a SWAT team, pretty much what we do is hire a search warrant. So if, if it's known that somebody has guns, if they have violent criminal history, like history of murders and stuff like that, shootings, uh, we serve the search warrants. Uh, we'll do you know, protection details, like when the Dalai Lama came or uh, the president came, we do protection for them. Uh, we do barricaded subjects, suicidal subjects, hostage situations. So in six years, I've, done a little bit of everything. I mean, I've dealt with babies being held hostage, I've dealt with people holding themselves hostage, just want to kill themselves, criminals who you know, run up in the house and barricade themselves, don't want to come out. So it's, it's a little bit of everything. Someone who has expressed that they have a lack of trust for the police or have problems with the police, let's try to address those. Um, just, I mean, he's not going to take you away or anything just kind of say what's your problem with the police is in general and let's try to get a dialogue going of, of what it is so somebody that has look, a problem just be honest and, and look I'll, before y'all even start before y'all even start I will say I understand why why people don't trust the police and I understand why people don't like the police like I just told you I grew up in a police household and I didn't like the police for a long time because I didn't understand what was going on and when you understand it helps you still might not like us and that's fine that's your, that's your choice but if you educate yourself about what's going on, even in individual interactions with the officers, it, it makes it a lot easier. I've had so many people that have come down to my office in internal affairs, and they walked in just angry as all get out, and they walked out saying, I get it. And a lot of times it's on us as officers to explain to you, I was always a person that I'd explain to you at the end of the day. I've gotten, I've put, I've, I've gotten in fights where people have ended up hurt. And they thanked me at the end of it because I explained to them. You know, I treated them right. It was a fight. You were fighting me, I was fighting you, I won. You lost. I'm sorry for you. And then I explained to them why I did what I did. And they were good with it. And most officers don't do a very good job of explaining to people why they were doing what they were doing. And it leaves people angry at the police thinking, well, you were just targeting me for where I live, why I'm dressed, what I look like, color of my skin. Because I'm a black male, because I got braids, because I got this, because I got that. When in fact, no, uh, that lady sitting on the porch called and said you had a gun and you were selling dope. That's a pretty good reason for me to stop you. It has nothing to do with you know, any of that other stuff. So, uh, now I might not tell you as the lady on the porch, because I, you know, I don't want you to come back on her, but you know, I had a reason to stop you. And a lot of times officers don't do a very good job of explaining to people why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, I also say officers can be assholes. We all know that. Everybody can be. We generally don't deal with the nicest people in the world. And that, that, takes, that takes a toll on how your attitude is. Uh, I'm not as nice as I was 15 years ago. When I was sitting in the classroom, I was a nice guy. You know, talking about, actually, that's probably a little jerk. But, huh? No, it was, I, was, I was actually probably mean when I was in high school and I didn't know. But, uh, you know, we deal with people on their worst days. Whether good people or bad people, we're dealing with them all on the worst day. Whether it's the, the nice little granny old lady who just, she got in her first accident and she's hurt. 
or it's the most hardened criminal who shot three people and he's a jerk. You know, we don't deal with people because they're having good days, right? And so that kind of that kind of takes a toll on you. You, you kind of treat, you tend to treat everybody like they're a criminal, uh, whether they are or not, just because it's so you're so used to. That's what you're dealing with. Uh, so I will say, understand that, you know, I've had people call me all kinds of names in the book for being a cop. I know they don't have a problem with me. They don't like me because I'm a cop. I'm fine with that. And I, on the other hand, I deal with all kinds of people who are criminals, but I can't treat you like you're a piece of crap just because I deal with a lot of people who are bad people. I can't treat everybody like that. So I'd ask you don't treat us all like you know, we're bad cops because you've seen a video or you've been treated poorly a couple times. That's just, that's just not the way it is. Um, it is. It's very easy to watch some of these videos out here and say, oh, well, look, look at what these officers are doing and blah, blah, blah. I'll tell you what, put me on camera all day long for a couple of years, and you're going you're gonna to see one or two things that I did that you'd be like, he's a horrible person, he needs to burn in hell. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. If you if you catch anybody on a bad on a bad day and a bad interaction, you can use that as an example of how horrible of a person they are. But I guarantee you, there's there's probably hundreds of hours of videos of me doing doing the right thing and treating people right. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and you too. If I followed you around with a camera all day, it's probably going to be mostly mundane stuff, nothing notable. But you're going to do one thing that's just stupid. I can play that for everybody and say, uh, look how stupid he is. And that, that's kind of how it is for police officers. So don't just necessarily judge all of us by one bad interaction by one officer or a couple of officers. It's not to say they're not bad officers out there. We know there are. Uh, you know, don't try to hide that. There's racist officers. There's officers who are thieves. There's officers who are pedophiles. Just like the rest of society. We try to weed those out, but they get through too. Questions you guys want? I'd rather not lead the discussion. I'd rather you guys talk about the different issues that we're having and hear from a different point of view here uh, about some of the things that we've talked about, targeting certain individuals, talking about the murders in Louisville. Somebody have anything they want to say? Somebody? You guys are, don't be shy. At this time, we so, need the Japanese club. And he said y'all went over Lydia. some of the statistics about the murders. Did y'all go over that? Japanese Mm -hmm. Look, we, we've had we've had more than 100 murders. I know they say it's 100 murders, but some of them are a little justified than uh, Some are like Shively or Jay Uh It's violent out there right now. You all know that. I know that. It's, it's violent out there right now. Uh, we have to be in the areas where the violence occurs, right? I always tell, I talk to recruit classes sometimes, and I tell them, it's my job to go out and find the people who are preying on innocent people, who are stealing from people, who are robbing people, who are killing people, and have them go off on me before they go off on you, right? Before they go off on society. So, like, that's my job is to go find the dude with the gun. How, I mean, if people are being shot, predominantly in certain areas or certain blocks, that's where I have to go. We have a segregated city. Most black people live with black people. White people live with white people. We're one of the most segregated cities in the country. It's sad, but it's true. I guarantee you all of you can probably count on one hand the number of families of the opposite race living in your neighborhood or on your block. If you, if you can even, if, if there's even any, if there's any, any people of the opposite race living on your block. Uh, so it might seem like we're preying on certain people because of race, but that's not the case. I'm going to police where the police are needed. Police are needed where violent crime is happening. Uh, police are needed everywhere, but the fact of the matter is, is that Violence occurs to people, predominantly from people that they know and near where they live. If you 
live in Beecher Terrace, there's a pretty good chance you're not going to get shot in Prospect. If you live in Prospect, there's a pretty good chance you're not going to get shot in Beecher Terrace. I have to go where the violence is, right? Uh, if you look at the statistics, our, our incidents of poor interactions are very, very low compared to the amount of people that we stop. We stop and we talk to a ton of people. Uh, less than, I think it's like .0001%, or it might even be another zero down in there, end up in officer-involved shootings. And I think we've shot uh, some less than 30 people in the last five years. And we've interacted with probably a million people. That's, that's pretty low. Your odds of being shot by us or having a bad interaction with us is far lower than your odds of being shot by somebody in the street. Uh, we are there to help people. We are there to keep violence down. Uh, and like I told the last class, the majority of people who are shot in this city, it's not random, okay? We have a few people every year that get shot randomly. You know, a store clerk that gets shot when they get robbed. Uh, you know, somebody who's literally just an innocent bystander and happens to catch a stray bullet. That happens. It happens rarely. The majority of people are shot by people they know and are shot over drugs. Period. What? Gambling. Gambling. And a lot of that, I mean, you're absolutely right. Uh, that's what I brought up in the last class. If you don't gamble, if you don't sell drugs, and you don't hang out with people selling drugs, you got a pretty good chance of not getting robbed and not getting killed. The, the next highest category is domestics. Is domestic violence. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, if you don't do those things, and you're not around those people doing those things, then you probably won't get shot. I mean, that's, that's who our victims are. Uh, uh, like I said, I worked in Beecher Terrace for uh, a little over three years. Uh, the last guy that just got shot in Beecher Terrace, good dude, Charles Hill. I talked to him probably two or three times a week. I liked him. Super nice guy. Super nice guy. I always knew he was doing dirt. We talked about his dirt. He wanted, he, he acted like he wanted to stop. He was, he was a nice guy. He'd ask me about my family. He'd ask me what my mom's doing, all this type of stuff. I'd ask him about him and his family. We were very cordial. But when Charles was shot, Charles had a gun. Charles had a dope on him. Charles knew what was going to happen to him. He knew what was going to happen to him. And he didn't stop. What am I supposed to do about that as an officer? I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm talking to him two, three days a week, making sure he's on the straight and narrow. But I'm there eight hours a day, five days a week. I'm not his babysitter. I can't make him make the right choices. I mean, and we actually care about these people. It hurt me to see that, that he got killed. He, he stopped me on Christmas night three years ago just to ask me how my holiday was. You know, that, I mean, he was a nice dude, but he was doing dirt, and it got him killed. If you don't do dirt, if you don't sell drugs, you don't gamble, and you uh, aren't hanging out with people that are doing those things, you got a pretty good chance of making it to adulthood without any issues. Plain and simple. You probably won't be locked up unless it's for something stupid, and you're probably not going to get shot or shoot anybody else. Can't make it any more simple than that. We talked about uh, gambling. I'm not going to name names, but I know two guys that they got murdered the same block as Charles Hill. They were they were kind of friends. I talked to them every day. One tried to rob the other during a dice game. They shot each other. Both of them died. And it's stupid. It's stupid. But it's a product of their decision making, and I'm not I'm not going to go into family histories and all that type of stuff and, and 
history of race in the city, but when it comes down to it, on an individual level, you have to make choices. You have to make choices of what type of lifestyle you're going to live. I could have very easily decided that, hey, my friends who are out here selling dope, they got money. I'm walking around in shoes that I've had on for the last 16 months that have holes in them. They have on new shoes. This is what I'm going to do. I could have very easily made that decision. Now, I had some, I, I had some good fortune, too. I'm not going to... I'm not going to act like it was just all me. I was lucky. But, you know, I had to make a decision, and it sucked. I spent 16 years old not hanging out with anybody in my neighborhood. Nobody. All the people that I grew up with. I hung out in the house. I hung out with people from school. Two of those dudes that I used to hang out with are dead. One's on trial for murder. I'm alive, I don't have to look over my, my shoulder at night, and I, I live a fairly comfortable life. Can it be more clear? Can you talk a little bit about how the LMPD is using body cameras and the, the car, the squad car cameras to help uh, you guys? So, so like a, uh, body cameras, uh, we don't even really go into squad car cameras because they're uh, not as influential as the in car cam or the body cameras, even though back when they first came about, everybody talked about them like it was a miracle or something. So, our body cameras, anytime we have interaction with the public, beyond just like if you stop me and ask me for directions, the body camera has to be on. All it is is a little, it's a little battery pack, about half the size of a cell phone, that has a button on it, they have to push, and it has a wire that goes to the camera. The camera's held on by a magnet. All right? You can imagine how easy it is for that button to get pushed and turned off, for that cord to come out, or for this to, to pop off the magnet, the camera to pop off the magnet. So you'll see videos that cut in and cut out. It's not because people are trying to cover stuff up. It's not because people are trying to hide stuff. When you fight, stuff comes off. When you get in scuffles, I have my badge ripped off, lost my pins, sunglasses, all that stuff, that camera's probably going to come off too. It's not always just saying that somebody's covering something up. Uh, but I will tell you, it's another eye out there. It's another perspective. It's not the end-all, be-all, but it does give us another third-party perspective. You say something, he says something, she says something, I say something, the camera says something different. Are, they all, are we all wrong? No. If it says something different from the camera, we all have different perspectives. And we have to take all of that into account and say, you know, to try to figure out exactly what happened. Uh, I watch body camera footage several times a week because people call and complain on officers. And uh, I can tell you the vast majority of the time the officers are doing the right thing. The vast majority of the time the officers are doing the right thing. What the officer didn't do is explain what was going on. They didn't do a very good job of explaining why they were doing what they were doing. And so a lot of people feel like they were slighted or done wrong by the police, whereas the body camera shows they weren't. Uh, like, like I said earlier, if you follow somebody around with a camera all day, you're going to catch them doing something wrong. You're going to catch them talking wrong. you catch them doing all kinds of stuff. Uh, that's not necessarily the point. The point is just to weed out bad behavior and provide another level of evidence. Uh, and the body camera just gives us another perspective. Uh, just for transparency's sake and for trust's sake, I'll explain to you kind of how the body camera work in that we can't alter the video. If we alter the video, the system automatically saves the original. And it, it marks who made what alterations, and those are saved. So every time that I look at a video, it has a log that says, Sergeant Paul Humphrey looked at this video, he looked at this part of the video, he made a copy of it, he looked at it from this computer at this time of the day. No. No. And, and, and so that's why systems like GoPro or something like that, you know, you can alter those videos without a problem. Uh, or cell phone videos and stuff like that. Or, you know, anything that's saved on the thumbs up. <coughs> These are all, these all leave markers anytime anything is done to them. And uh, that's for a reason. That's so that 
that somebody can't come back later and say, well, the police changed this video, the police did this, the police did that. No, we can show you the original video, and we can show you all the alterations that we made. Whether we blurred out people's faces, bleeped out people's names, that type of stuff, or just only showed you part of the video. The video might be an hour long, but we're only releasing three minutes of it, just three minutes of that. Right? So, but the original is always safe. So we, we can't, we can't tamper with that. And it's set up that way, just so that people can't make that argument that we're doing something wrong here with the video. Which I've had people say, and I'm not really sure how to convince them that, first of all, I'm a cop, I'm not a computer tech. I, I'm, I'm lucky to be able to you know, record the video on that disc. So, sit up here and make alterations and stuff like that. Be above my pay grade. But, um, also, the video doesn't capture everything. The video, there's limitations to video. You can hear certain things when we're talking that the video might not pick up on. I'm going to see certain things. You know, the video's pointing this way, and I turn my head and I look this way. I'm going to see something the video doesn't pick up on. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. That doesn't mean that it's not a factor in it. So understand when you when you see these videos, whether it's cell phone videos, body camera videos, that it's not the whole story. It's just another part of the story. Uh, there's a big difference between the human perception and video. If you're going to slow things down on video, uh, take for instance, I'll just tell you about reaction time versus video. Uh, there's a video from Oklahoma where and an officer's chasing a guy with a gun. The guy clearly has a gun. Nobody's denying that. Uh, they kind of wrestle over it. Uh, and the guy gets up. He points the gun at the officer. And then he turns to run. The officer shoots him in the back. You slow down that video, and it looks like it's, it's this heinous shooting. This officer just shot this guy in the back while he's running away. But if you understand how... You know, reaction time and all that stuff works. You understand that officer never had a choice. Like, he made that decision to shoot while that guy's pointing the gun at him. And by the time that, that signal, of, the light signal hit his brain and said, this guy's turning around, he has to make a conscious decision not to shoot and stop that signal that's already told him to shoot from going to his hand, it's too late. He's already shot. And, uh, Y'all seen the little reactionary test where somebody holds something up and you have to grab it before it falls? Y'all ever seen that? You can, you can do that, and I can say like that, but it's already gone. Because my reaction, I saw it. I saw it as soon as it started moving, but I didn't start moving until it was out of the way, until it was gone. And that's kind of the way it is in some of this stuff. Uh, uh, you know, low light, bright light, there might be something that, that blinds me that the camera picks up on, or in low light, there might be something that I can see that the camera can't see, or vice versa. Um, so just understand that the body camera stuff is just a another perspective. Um, a lot of times, like on body cameras, I can hear what the officer's saying, but I can't hear what the other person's saying. Just because the officer's right here next to it, and the other person's far away. Uh, so body cameras are... They're, they're, they're really, really good. They're a really, really good tool, but you can't just look at a video and say, this is what happened, it was right or wrong. It's just another part of the story. Can you talk about how you're trained or how Louisville Police is training officers on both the social aspects you touched on in the first class about how you all are doing more trainings about the kind of implicit biases that we talked about and how what Louisville Police is doing to try to improve relations with the community in that aspect. So, uh, has anybody heard of the President's Task Force on 21st Century Police? All right, so President Obama put together a task force that went around the country anyway. They came up with a report that had all these pillars that are important for the police. Uh, and a lot of that was understanding how to be transparent, how to build trust, and how to combat implicit bias. Uh, y'all understand implicit bias? So y'all talk about that. Yeah. Here's the thing about implicit bias. 
is none of us are immune to it. All right, the white cop and the black cop, the white civilian and the black civilian, all pretty much have the same implicit biases. Uh, we've kind of, we might express them differently, but we generally kind of think the same things. The difference between me and you and my implicit bias and your implicit bias is that I can act on it differently, right? So I have to be much more aware of my implicit bias uh, than maybe you, you do. You might say something that just makes people mad. I say something that violates your rights. Uh, and I have to be much more aware of that. And we are training people on how to spot their implicit biases and make sure that they're doing everything by the law as opposed to by a hunch, right? Because that hunch that I just got this feeling that something's wrong here, it's, it's a good tool, and we have to lean on those, but we have to know why we're using it, why we're using it, where that comes from. Is that happening everywhere? I can't speak for everywhere else. I know a ton of departments are doing it. Uh, this was a this was a national push by the Obama, the Obama administration. Some departments were already on it. Some departments were already pushing it. Uh, others, I mean, there's people out there that say implicit bias doesn't exist. Is it ongoing with the LPD? Yeah. So uh, right now, our uh, we are required to complete 40 hours of training every year. That's that's the state minimum standard. Uh, as part of that, we have uh, an eight-hour block is on uh, implicit bias and that type of stuff. Uh, so we spend an entire day on implicit bias uh, as part of our mandate. One day is on legal updates uh, and changes to the law. Uh, so we know all the Supreme Court cases that say you can't do this, you can't do that, uh, that type of stuff. We spend time on active shooter response, so like school shootings and stuff like that. Uh, we're doing stuff on human trafficking as well this, this year. So out of that 40, 40 hours, we're spending a quarter of it, uh, or 20% of it, on implicit bias training. Uh, actually, that's a little more than that. Uh, we went over it last year. So this is something that we do every year. We also have uh, other classes that we have on uh, emotional intelligence, moral intelligence, ethics, stuff like that, uh, that end up being optional as well. So this is, this is something that we've, we've taken seriously as a department. Um, each individual officer, I can't tell you whether they take it seriously or not. Some do, some don't. Uh, some people still think we haven't gone to the moon. So, so, so some people you're just not going to change. But it is, it, is, it is something that's it's a serious issue. And if you don't understand, if you don't have the emotional intelligence to understand why you're acting the way you're acting, uh, then it makes this job much more difficult. Uh, because what I do is going to cause you to react a certain way. Uh, and if I don't understand what I'm doing and the image that I'm putting, putting out, then it's going to be very hard for me to figure out what you're doing and why you're doing it. We have to understand that culturally people act differently in different circumstances. Uh, we all know that. Uh, you, go to, you go to one, one, one family's uh, party and everybody's loud, <coughs> boisterous. You go to another family's party, everybody separates and sits on their own and watches, watches TV. Everybody acts differently. And we have to, we have to take that into account, uh, whether it's by race, Religion, culture, ethnicity, uh, socioeconomic class, neighborhood. Uh, we have to be aware of those things. Uh, and, and we do take, take it seriously. Um, I know, I think yesterday, or no, no, when Detective Jim Clark was here, he said that uh, there weren't as many applicants to be police officers as there used to be, especially with COVID, what's going on. So I was wondering if that, if you're still trying to be as rigorous as you can with finding like, good people to be. So we, we did have, we did for a long time have have problems with uh, getting the numbers that we need. 
uh, to apply. Uh, but our standards are our standards. So if you have something in your history, your personality that says you're not fit to do this job, you're not fit to do this job. If we're supposed to hire 40 people and we have to hire 38, then that's just the way it is. Um, and we get people in the academy in the first week and they realize hey, they're not cut out for this. Um, to be a police officer, you have to go through a background check, all that type of stuff. They'll interview, they'll interview past employers, they'll interview your neighbors, all kinds of stuff to see what type of person you are. We also do uh, a psychological test. So you take a written psychological test as well as have a psychological interview to find out whether you're fit for this. Uh, here's the thing is that you can't cover everything. Right? There's going to be bad people to get in. There's going to be people that develop issues over time. Uh, and there's going to be people that just don't have the skill set to make some of the decisions that we're required to make. Right? They don't. Or they don't have the personality for it. I, I can tell you, it's, it's for me. It's not fun to put somebody in the penitentiary. It's not. The, I, I remember the first the first time I put a felony charge on a young black man. I knew, if you look at the statistics, once you catch your first felony, your odds of success in life go down exponentially. Odds are you're gonna be a criminal for a long time once you're a convicted felon. Because it limits, you can't vote, it limits the jobs you can get. So that was not a happy moment for me to put a felony on, a first felony on a young black man, right? I still have to do it. Right? I mean, there's certain things that we have to do that I might not like doing, but I have to do. There's other parts that I do like doing. Um, and this job will wear on you over time. Like I said, we, we deal with people on their, on their bad days. And if everybody was shitty to you every day of the week, eventually you kind of you take that on. And that's kind of how we are. You know, we deal with people at crappy moments every single day, all day long. And you know, sometimes we bounce that back to you, intentionally or unintentionally. And that's where emotional intelligence comes into play. I, I remember one, we got called on a break in the progress, someone working late wide. 24th of market. We got called on a break in the progress. Somebody it was like three o'clock in the morning. And it turns out it was the it was the store owner. Uh, but you know, we didn't know that. A neighbor called said nobody's supposed to be in the store at this time. So we're searching it, we encounter them. We stop him, and he starts yelling at me. And I'm like, hold up, dude. I'm here to make sure your stuff's not getting broken into. So the next thing you know, we're arguing because I'm mad that he, he didn't want the police there. You know, and he's mad that the police, you know, stopped him and put him in handcuffs. You know, can you, I mean, can you see both sides of that? I see why he's mad. He's in his own place, and he's getting put in handcuffs. I'm mad because I'm doing my job to make sure nobody's breaking into your place. I don't know you own this place. So, but it took emotional intelligence for me to say, my partner Chuck at the time, I said, Chuck, deal with him. I had to walk away. I was like, I'm not, because I was, I, was I was about to go off. I'll be all the way honest. But it took some emotional intelligence for me to take a deep breath and just walk away and say, look, dude, we're not going to get anywhere here. Uh, I'm going to walk away and let you deal with him. And the guy calmed down eventually, and it was everything was copacetic. But at a certain, you know, those things happen, and certain people are able to deal with those stressful situations differently from others. And I deal with stressful situations all the time. It's just that day I wasn't happy. At that moment I wasn't happy. You know, we, we try to weed that out. We try to train it into people, but there's only so much you can do. Anybody else? We got just a little under a minute. Anybody else have anything you want to say? Or yeah, I do the training. Do y'all have to do the, uh, like, where y'all pepper spray? The training? It's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. I'd rather be tasting. Oh, you guys have been taking food. People are like, I'd rather be tasting. Thank you, guys.